One of the things I love about the Lord is that in the Old and New Testament, God takes people who we would think would be unusable and uses them in a powerful way. Moses comes to mind, a murderer, a stutterer, did not speak well, but he chooses Moses to lead the people out of bondage in Egypt and become ruler over the nation of Israel. And then I look at David, a shepherd boy, nothing special about him, overlooked, smaller than the rest of his brothers, obscure youngest, least likely person to be the king of Israel, one of the greatest kings, if not the greatest king of Israel. Then I look at Paul, a horrific past, a persecutor of Christians, someone who went against whatever God stood for, but yet God redeems him and uses him to write over half of the New Testament to become a fantastic church planner, to save many souls, to plant many churches. God uses him. Then you have Peter, somebody with a quick bad mouth, uh, speaks too quickly, uh, jumps the gun, and God uses him to, to do many things and share the gospel. He uses him in the Pentecost to save thousands upon thousands of people. And then if I go back to the Old Testament, I think of Isaiah, a man of unclean lips, and God uses him in a powerful way. Why am I saying that? In our passage today, God chooses a woman with a, a horrid past, many husbands. She would be deemed a prostitute. Uh, she's uh, a woman in a male-dominated society, so she's considered property, has no rights, and yet God uses her to become a great evangelist. What is God saying? If I can use these people, I can use you. If I have a purpose for these people, a mission for these people, guess what? I have a mission and purpose for you. Stay tuned for this week's Sunday School Lesson. Hello, my name is Reverend Dr. John W. Wilson III. I am bringing the Sunday School lesson for this Sunday, February 7th, 2021. The title of the lesson is called, Call to Testify. It will come out of the Gospel of John chapter 4. We'll look at verses 25 through 42. But as customary, I need your help. I would like for this Sunday School lesson, if it blesses you to reach as many people as possible. So if there's a like button in your Facebook or YouTube, hit that like button, hit that share button. If you're on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. Help me get it out to many people as possible. I thank you in advance. So let's get into our lesson. It's a, it's a powerful lesson. It's a great lesson. It's a liberating lesson. So it deals with chapter four. The context of the lesson is chapter four verse 1 through 42. But because of our time constraints and because of what our lesson is about, we're going to focus on 25 through 42, but I'm going to give you a little history, a little prelude of what's happening so our passage will make better sense. So let's look at our passage. We have uh, Jesus is growing in popularity. His ministry has started. Uh, John the Baptist is the forerunner of Jesus. John the Baptist had a fruitful ministry. His uh, ministry, was, he was very popular, baptized many people. And now the Pharisees are looking on, almost like they were looking on with, with uh, John the Baptist with this stain. They're not happy about what's going on. And they're saying that Jesus is baptizing more people than John the Baptist. And the Bible tells that Jesus baptized no one. It was his disciples who were doing the baptizing. But the point of it is, is that Jesus' popularity 
far exceeds that of John the Baptist. And just like John the Baptist's popularity hit a nerve with the Pharisees, is hitting a nerve with the Pharisees because of Jesus' popularity, so much so they may pl they are planning to do something about it, probably something hostile. So what Jesus says, the Bible tells us, Jesus says, well, I'll go to Galilee. And so Jesus is going to leave Judea, travel about six days or so, or seven or eight, to get to Galilee. But in order to get to Galilee, the shortest route is Samaria in the northern kingdom of Israel. So you have to go from Judea to Samaria to Galilee, and maybe uh, to Samaria, it might be a day or two or maybe three days trip, but it's a long way. And so Jesus and the disciples are going to make that trip. Uh, the Bible tells us that they do make that trip. And so they arrive to a, a Samaria. There's a town called Sychar. The, uh, Jesus, they arrive there. There's a town in there. The disciples go to town to buy some food. Jesus stays at a well, Jacob's well. That's the well that uh, Jacob gave to Joseph. That's the place where Joseph is buried. Uh, the Samaritans take great pride in this Jacob's well. It's authentic. It's the real deal. It gives a lot of water. It's life-sustaining to them. They take a lot of pride in there. So Jesus has traveled to Sychar. He's at Jacob's well. Is at the sixth hour. The sixth hour means that it's noontime, meaning that's the heat of the day. So Jesus is thirsty. He is hungry. He, they have walked a lot. And one thing we have to understand is that Jesus is human just like us. Uh, he got tired. He got thirsty. He got hungry. He needed rest. He got happy. He got sad. He, he grieved. This talks about Jesus' humanity. So in his humanity, he's thirsty and he's tired. And he needs some water because it's it's the heat of the day. So Jesus, the Bible tells us, is sitting at the well. And then as he's sitting at the well, the Bible tells us that a woman from Samaria came up to draw water. And Jesus breaks a cardinal rule. He speaks to the woman of Samaria. In those days, men didn't speak to women. Women were property. Women were looked down upon. And in this case, a Samaritan woman was even looked down upon even lower. And so by Jesus speaking to her, he's breaking all kinds of traditions, all kinds of cultural norms to uh, speak to this woman, which sends a message to the reader that Jesus is not a respecter of a person. He'll speak to a man, a woman like he will speak to a man. He does not bound by these traditions or social norms. He's trying to illustrate, uh, John is, that that Jesus is liberating women, that we are to speak to women. And so we are not to have those bad ideas, those prejudices against women or discriminate against women. So Jesus says, give me a drink. For disciples had gone into the city to buy food. And look how the response to the Samaritan woman, she knows the cultural norms. How is it that you, a Jew, Ask a drink for me, a woman of Samaria. Jews and Samaritans, they don't speak, let alone ask for water, let alone drink from the same jar. That doesn't happen. It says, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. They're a hostile. Let me give you a little history about Samaria and how the Samaritans came to be. The Assyrians, a ruthless nation, conquered northern kingdom, God used the Syrians to punish the northern kingdom for their idolatry. Assyria took people out of the northern kingdom, left some Jews there, but brought their people into uh, the northern kingdom of Israel. Those Assyrians that were there intermarried with the Jewish people that were there. They had children. They were called Samaritans. Uh, and the, the Jews hated them because they were mixed. They were half-breeds. And non-Jews hated them too because they were mixed with the evil Assyrian Empire. The Samaritans had their own form of religion. They only adopted the first five books of the 
Old Testament, the Pentateuch. They did have their own temple. They did have their own interpretation of the first five books, which was a little bit off, uh, off of orthodoxy, a little bit different. Uh, but the good thing about them, they looked forward to a, a promised Messiah. Out of those five books, they understood that a Messiah was coming that will tell them all the truth, that would save them from their sins, that would give them salvation. They did know that and they hung on to that. So here we have the Samaritans and the Jews. They are hostile toward one another. They fought one another. It was very dangerous for Jesus to travel through Samaria to get to Galilee. Very dangerous. But he did it anyway. So this Samaritan woman is wondering, why is this man talking to me? That's, that doesn't work. Why is he talking to me? He knows how we feel about each other. Even though it doesn't seem like she felt that way about Jews in general, but she knew how maybe male Jews felt about Samaritan people. So anyway, so we have here. He said, how did that a Jew ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaritan? And then Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God, he turned something physical into something spiritual. He turns up a need for physical water into a need on the Samaritan woman's part for spiritual water, or he's going to call it living water. The Samar uh, so he says, if you knew the gift of God and who is it saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So now Jesus changed the conversation to spiritual matters. Uh, the woman said, uh, you have nothing to draw water with. The well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father, Jacob? She's sensing something about Jesus that is different, that he could be a prophet, that he could be some type of spiritual leader, that he is not like an ordinary man. And so he, Jesus has, has uh, plucked her curiosity. She is now on spiritual matters where Jesus wants her to be. And so uh, Jesus says this, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. Look, he's, he's getting her curiosity. What kind of water is Jesus talking about? Whatever it is, I want that. He says, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. That's the key word, eternal life. That's what she wants. The woman said to her, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty and come here and draw and, 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 and come here and draw water. She still doesn't get it quite right. And so Jesus is going to uh, uh, talk to her a little bit more and he's going to explain a little bit more. So he goes with this. He says, go to her. He says, he tells her about a history. He says, you're not married. You've been married five times and the husband that you have now is not your husband. The man that you're with now is not your husband. He says, and then uh, she said, what you said is true. And the woman said, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. First she calls him a Jew. Now she perceives that he's a prophet. And then we go on and talk about worship. He said, for our fathers worship on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. And Jesus says, and there will come a point in time in the future where if you will not worship on a mountain, you will not worship in, in uh, Jerusalem, but you will worship, true worship, you will worship in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. He said that it will come a time that the place you worship will not matter. It will matter what's on the inside of you, that you're worshiping in spirit and in truth. It says God is spirit. In truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so the woman is, uh, is perceiving that Jesus is not an ordinary person, that he's a prophet. Uh, Jesus is, is uh, sharing with her, uh, leading her to the point that she will become saved, that she will become a believer. And while the disciples, the key thing, the disciples are away in town so he can talk to her by himself uninterrupted. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming. Look, he took her from a Jew to a prophet. Now she's talking about the Messiah. She's 
looking forward to the Messiah. She's anxious about the Messiah. The people of Samaria wanted the Messiah to come. And she says this, I know that I know that Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. So she says, I know you're a prophet, but when the Messiah comes, he's going to share with us all things. And Jesus says to her, I who speak to you am he. I am the Messiah that you're talking about. I am the Messiah that will tell you all things. And then the passage says here, right at that time, he finished talking with her about spiritual matters, revealing himself to her. Disciples come back. And, and theologians call this God's providence because God timed everything. Providence means that God is in control. He controls when things happen, when they don't happen. He orchestrates all things to work together for his good, for his glory. He, he, he's able to take something bad and make it good for his glory. And this is in this case right here, he held off the disciples in town until Jesus had time to talk to this woman. If they would have came back earlier, they would have messed everything up. They would have said, baby, Jesus, why are you talking to her? Or they would have tried to get into the conversation. Or maybe the Samaritan woman would have been intimidated with all the other disciples there. Or maybe she would have felt uncomfortable. Maybe she would not have opened up like, like she did with Jesus. And then if they would have come a little later, they wouldn't have seen Jesus talking to a woman, a Samaritan woman. They wouldn't see Jesus sending them a message that to, demonstrate, to treat women like property, to discriminate against them, to say they have no voice, to not talk to them at all, is wrong. It's not God's will. It's not what I want you to do. You, I have bigger plans for you. When the disciples came back, they were able to see Jesus dialoguing with the women. And they began to ask questions in their mind. Why is he doing it? What does he see? What does he run from her? What is he going to give her? And so Jesus gave them an example of what it means to, to, to break cultural norms. And that the cultural norms of women being less than is something that is wrong and cannot continue. And so it says this. Just then the disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman. So they were surprised when they saw that. They were astonished. They couldn't believe it. They could not understand why. But no one said, who do you seek? Meaning, in other words, uh, Jesus, why are you talking to her? If they did, Jesus would have said, I was thirsty. I needed water. Why are you talking with her? Jesus would have said, I'm giving her living water. I'm giving her eternal life. They didn't say anything because out of respect for Jesus being their rabbi uh, and them being the disciples, they did not say anything. Maybe they were speechless. Maybe they were so shocked they couldn't say anything. But I'm sure it's out of respect for Jesus. So the woman left her jar. She left that water jar filled with water probably. And went into town and said to the people. Some people say she uh, left that jar because she was in a hurry. Some people say she left that jar for Jesus to get water. I think she did it for both reasons. The water was full. She could not take that big heavy jar and run into town and, and tell the people what, what she, who she had seen and, and what she had talked about. So I think it was for both reasons. I really believe that. And so uh, the Bible says this. So she went into town, said to people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Come see a man who told me all I ever did. Can this be the Christ? I love what she said. She says, told me all I ever did. We know about the husbands, but in the Bible, sometimes we get a condensed version of the conversation. We get the nuts and bolts. We get the, the, uh, the concise, the cliff notes version. I'm sure they may have talked about other things. I'm sure they had a lengthy conversation. I'm sure Jesus told her more about more than just the five husbands. He probably told her a lot about herself. He ministered to her. And she goes, into, I, that I ever did, can this be the Christ? That's the key thing. Can this be the Christ? Instead of saying, I'm telling you this is it, I'm telling you this, she raised the curiosity of the people in town that this man uh, told me all I ever did. Is it possible that he could be the Messiah that we're looking for? 
And that struck a curiosity with the people. They saw her excitement. They saw her enthusiasm. They saw her testimony. And then she says, could this be the Christ? And I don't know about you. If you've been looking for Christ and someone says, could this be the Christ? It would behoove you to go find out if this is the Christ or not. So they went out of the town, out of the town of Sychar, and were coming to him. Meanwhile, while this was going on, the Bible says the disciples were urging Jesus to eat. But Jesus takes this opportunity, just like he did the uh, Samaritan women, takes something physical, uh, a physical need, and now he turns into a spiritual need on their part. He says, but he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. So the disciples take it literally, just like the, the Samaritan women did, and they say to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? They say, well, if he got food that I know nothing about, somebody must have fed him while I'm gone, but that's not possible because Jews don't eat the food of Samaritans. They don't interact. How could that be? And then Jesus said this to clear it up. My food is to do, my spiritual food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Jesus used that opportunity to tell them that he is there to do the will of God and to accomplish his work. And indirectly, I believe he's there to tell them that their food is to do the will of God and to accomplish the work that he has for them too. See, I believe that just like uh, Jesus has came down with a purpose, a will of God to accomplish his work, God is giving you and me, all believers, a purpose and a mission in life to accomplish, and when we accomplish that, we are doing his will. So we ought to do the will of God, just like Jesus is, and we ought to accomplish the work or the mission or the purpose that God has given us, just like Jesus did. Jesus, his uh, purpose and mission, his will, was to die on the cross so that and, and to re be resurrected so that many would be saved, so that sins would be forgiven, so that the gospel could be preached and people could be saved. That's what his work was. Jesus came down to save via dying on the cross. That's what his purpose is. It said, he said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? So this time is around December and January, four months from harvest time. Four months, that's the key thing. Four months from picking up the ripe crop. Four months from harvesting. Four months from celebrating. Four months from having an abundance of, of crop, abundance of fruit. Four months from the harvest. He says, look what he says right here. There are yet four months till the harvest come. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see the fields are white for harvest. I can imagine when Jesus said, lift up your eyes, they can look and see the people from Sychar coming to meet Jesus. They're still a far way off, but they can see them coming. And Jesus is saying, that's the harvest. That's, they are white for harvest. They are ready for the gospel. They are ready to be saved. Lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. And what he's saying is this. In harvest time, there's six months from sowing and reaping. In this case, they're four months away. But generally, in harvest time, there's six months gap between what you sow and what you reap. When you sow, you automatically don't reap. You wait. You wait till the seed germinates. You wait till the, the, the ground nourishes that seed. You wait until the crop starts growing, starts growing. Then you have to wait until the crop is ripe for harvest. That takes about six months before you can celebrate the harvest that has come. And when Jesus says this, in the spiritual realm, it doesn't work that way. There's no time constraints. There's no six months of waiting. There's no sowing uh, and, and, and then there, there's waiting. It doesn't have to be that way. And what he's saying is this, is that uh, the harvest is now. In the, in the spiritual realm, the harvest is always now. It's never later. The harvest is always right. 
for sharing the gospel, for leading people to Christ, for salvation. The harvest is always right now. It is always right. That's what he's saying. There's no need to wait. Look out there. Look with your eyes. Open your eyes. See all the people that are there. See the people are coming. You will see people from other places. You'll see all that you see tells you that the harvest is now. Jesus says in Matthew that the uh, harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. In other words, the harvest is always going to be plentiful. It will always be the right time to lead people to Christ and offer them salvation. Then he says right here, already the one who reaps is receiving wages. Maybe he's talking about the Samaritan woman who went to town, gave her testimony, shared, shared what Jesus has done for them, and now people are, are believing. Maybe that's who he's talking about right now. Anyone who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life. In other words, that, that, spirit, that Samaritan woman is, is receiving a, a reward or some type of spiritual income. And she's gathering fruit for eternal life. She is leading people to Christ for eternal life. And look what it says. So that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. In this case here, the sower is Jesus Christ. He sowed into her. It took. And now she in turn. And so, so Jesus was able to reap there. And she in turn is sowing to others. And she was able to reap a harvest as they come to Christ. And what Jesus is saying is this. In the spiritual realm, there are times where the sower and reaper coincide. They, you sow and immediately there's a harvest. There's a reaping of the harvest. And when that happens, guess what? The sower and the reaper can celebrate together. They can rejoice. You can sow in the morning or you can sow now and then somebody can get saved. And the sowing and the reaping take place almost simultaneously. And that's a time to rejoice. It doesn't work like the agriculture where you sow and then you have to wait until you can do a harvest. Yes, and some people take a long time, but in the spiritual realm, oftentimes, sowing and reaping happens at, a, at the same time. And then he says right here, uh, he says, it says, so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true. One sows, another reaps. In the spiritual realm, uh, there's a sower and then somebody comes and reaps. In the spiritual realm, somebody plants and then somebody reaps the harvest. In the agricultural world, the person who sows is often the person who reaps. But in the spiritual realm, it's different. And what Jesus is leading up to is saying that there are people that have gone before you who have sown, meaning have, have talked about the Messiah coming, who has proclaimed the, the Messiah that will come and forgive sins, that who will proclaim that salvation is of the Lord, who has told about there's a Messiah coming, who's told us about to look for the Messiah. There are prophets who have done that. John the Baptist have done that. And then he's saying here is that because he has done that, because people have anticipated the coming of the Christ, all you have to do is to share the gospel and reap the harvest. That's all. When Christ dies on the cross, the work is done, the labor is done. Those prophets preaching Christ's coming, Christ's coming, that he will die for our sins. The Redeemer is coming. The work has been done. So in this generation right now, much of the work is done. People know about it. They have anticipated the coming of Christ. All we got to do is take this harvest who's waiting for the Lord, who needs the Lord so desperately. All we have to do is share the gospel and reap this white harvest. That's all we got to do. And that's what Jesus is saying here. The time is not to wait. The time for the harvesting is right now. In the spiritual realm, you harvest 365 days a year, 25, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's what you do. He says, look what he says. One sows, another one reaps. Work has been done. You are the reaper. Look what he says to the disciples. I sent you to reap. Because the work has been done for which you did not labor. I commission you to go and share the gospel, to win people for Christ, to, to lead people in salvation, to offer eternal life. Because the work has been done by the prophets, by John the Baptist, by myself. Others have labored 
and you have entered into their labor. You are going to benefit from their labor. You are going to be a reaper where other ones have sown. Then the Bible tells us many Samaritans from that time believed in him. That woman's testimony was so powerful that many in that town believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. He told me all I ever done. I wanted the enthusiasm, the, the, the passion that she told her story with. The, it was compelling enough for people to believe. The Holy Spirit moved. And it was compelling enough for people to believe. So when the Samaritans came, they already heard about Jesus. They heard how great he is. They heard that he was, that he was, he told this woman everything they did, that he was at least a prophet, that she believed, that she believed that he was a Messiah. And they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed with them for two days. Look what he did. He stayed with a people that was hostile to his, his people, and his people were hostile to them. They didn't like each other. He broke another cultural barrier. The gospel supersedes how you feel for another people, how you feel for another race. Whether you like somebody or not, the gospel is the most important thing. A lot of times we have too many Jonas that don't like a particular race, don't like a particular people, and they refuse to share the gospel. What Jesus says here, I, I, I break all tradition, all cultural barriers. I break all hate. I'm going to spend two days with the Samaritans who we don't like, who don't like us, who have a history of hostility, who have a history of fighting one another, who are culturally different. I'm going to spend two days with them because I'm going to break down all cultural norms because I want these people to know me and to be saved because that's the most important thing. He lifts up women. This woman becomes an evangelist for Jesus Christ. Jesus talks to her, breaks all cultural barriers. Now he breaks all racial or ethnic barriers by talking, by spending time with the Samaritans. What? Does that mean for you and me? That means you and me, we, we can't only share the gospel with the people that look like us, that act like us, that live around us. we got to share the gospel to people who are different from us, who we may not like, who we may not understand, who may there be, host may be hostility to. we got to share the gospel to any and everybody that is lost. That's what we're commissioned to do. That's the will of God. That's the work that he's talking about. And so here, so he stays two days, and guess what? And many more believed. Many more believed because of his word, because of the teachings that came out of his mouth, because of the truth that came out of his mouth. Many believed. In fact, the Bible tells us that many believed in those two days, then believe the when the Samaritans to woman gave her testimony. It said, look what it says right here. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said we believe, for we heard it for ourselves. They were no longer secondhand witnesses. Hearing what somebody else's testimony was now they had a testimony of their own. They were first-hand witnesses, and the first-hand witnesses caused them to believe even more. They had their own testimony. We believe better when we have our own testimony. A lot of people say, I don't believe what my grandmother says. I believe what my mother says. I believe what my aunt says. No, that sometimes is not enough. It's better when you believe because of your own testimony. It's better. It's more powerful. Look what it says here. We heard for ourselves and we know that this indeed is the Savior of the world. That means read the Bible for yourself. Listen to the truth for yourself. Now it's okay to hear from some miracle. I'm not doubting that. that people did get saved. But eventually you're going to want to know it for yourself and not just rely on somebody's testimony. And when you know it for yourself, you'll have that same passion as that woman has. Okay? And it says here, we heard it for ourselves. We know that this is, this is, that it is indeed the Savior of the world. When they heard it for themselves, they said, this is the Savior of the world. 
What does the Savior of the world mean? Israel would have said that Jesus is the Savior of the nation of Israel. They would have been dead wrong. God chose a Gentile people to proclaim for the very first time that Jesus was the Savior of the world. And indeed, he's the Savior of the world. He's the Savior of Jews and Gentiles. He is the Savior of the world. Uh, he, he, he came to save everybody, to save the lost. Yes, uh, it was supposed to go through Israel. They were supposed to be the light of the world and to be the evangelists of the world. But the big picture was that everybody was going to be saved. And indeed, Jesus is the Savior of the world. He died for everybody. John 3, 16. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Whoever. Jesus died for the world. He's the Savior of the world. And if you had to pick one thing what this passage is about, everything leads to this last statement. Savior of the world. He's chased out of town from Judea because of the Jewish Pharisees that don't like him. Goes to Samaritan, Samaritan, Samaria, where people don't like Jews, but they receive him. He's the savior of the Jews, but he's also the savior of Samaritans. He's the savior of Samaritans, but he's also, as we find out, the savior of the Gentiles mean that he's a savior in the entire world. He loves you and me. He died for you and me. If it was just you and me needed to be saved, he would die for us. Jesus Christ is the savior of the world. I hope this lesson has been beneficial to you. Hope it's been a blessing. Share it with your friends and family. I hope you have a great Sunday and great Sunday school. Uh, I love you. I care for you. I'll see you next week. Uh, I am doing fantastic. I am at 100%. God is good. I just want to say pray for those who are dealing with COVID. It is a dangerous disease. They need our prayer. I appreciate your prayers for me. And I just thank God. He chose in his mercy and goodness to spare me because many people have not been spared. And I'm no different than anyone else. God bless you. Love you much.